Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention to what I can offer you as a master coach. I can help you to focus on your why with clarity, uniting your passion with your purpose with a plan to create the life you truly desire. Book a free 20 minute coaching call right now via calendly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson forward slash call and we can take it from there. Lee Jackson, welcome back. How are you doing? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm good. Thanks. I'm just about to publish a book and uh, that gives you a nice kind of sense of well-being, I suppose, of achieving something. So, yeah, I'm doing I'm doing well on this uh, slightly miserable, uh, dark day, Amy. It's lovely to chat to you and uh, and uh, recap some of the stuff that we talked about. Was it a year ago now, I think? Over a year ago, yes. Back in episode 252, Get Good at Life, we called it. Yes. Well, <laughs> I listened to it um, before the interview today, and I realised a few things. One is that I can blame you for quite a few things that I've done in the year after this. You're an expert uh, sort of interviewer. You, if anyone listens to that in- to that interview, it's it's quite interesting because you you only say about five sentences in the whole interview, and I thought, oh, that's just because I'm a big extrovert talking too much. But I think you were doing all sorts of sneaky coaching there. You were just letting me talk, uh, which was wonderful. So yeah, I came on that podcast telling you about I'm writing a book called Get Good at Work, which I which I was writing, and and then you pushed me on this thing. We talked about get good. I, I said, oh, maybe I've got a book in me called Get Good at Life, and so Get Good at Work got completely shelved, and Get Good at Life is now a book and will be coming out in April this year. So next month at the time of recording. So uh, yeah, so I completely went in a different direction it's still got tips about work in there because work's part of life but I actually decided to go for a a personal personal development book um which I didn't think I would be doing for a while but I've gone for it I've done it 50,000 words I've done and completed so I'm uh, yeah so I guess I'm partly here to blame you Amy for causing me a, a year of <laughs> A year of writing a book that I didn't think I was going to write, but I guess I found a bigger why, I suppose, as you would say. And it's really interesting because when you were describing the book that you were writing at the time, and I think you said it was your 12th, 13th book, you said you were you were writing Get Good at Work. And through the process of writing that, out came a whole load of other pieces which was get good at life essentially and you said that sort of came out through a osmosis and what's interesting is the shelving of one book for the priority of another is that a reflection of where you are in life in that life has taken over for you the priority over work I think uh, so I, I I mean part of my job as a speaker as a uh, I mean, I'll do a little bit of my journey as a speaker, which we don't wasn't in the previous podcast. But uh, you're part of the PSA, the Professional Speaking Association, and um, there's 600 ish speakers in that. And over the years, I, I kind of got known. Um, I did one talk on slides on PowerPoint many, many years ago, and I did it to help the association because I felt that there was a gap that no one else was doing. So I did one talk, and I got known as the guy who talks about PowerPoint. But I was genuinely, and we talked this a lot in the last podcast, I was genuinely just trying to help people. So I did, in fact, write a book, and it's now called Get Good at Slides. or was PowerPoint surgery back in the days. But So I, did, I wrote that to help people, and then ended up getting, oh, you're the guy that does the slides, and that kind of went around. And then, I, obviously, I've always spoken in schools. School's always been a part of my business. And I got known, oh, but you're doing schools. But the actual, the actual thing was is that quite quietly, I was doing loads of motivational talks for adults in the public sector and the private sector. And I was just quietly doing those talks, but I wasn't known, I suppose, 
as the guy that did get good at life or as it became or get good at work. So, so I suppose I, um, <laughs> rather naively trying to help other speakers, I kind of got badged with something that wasn't really me because fundamentally, and we talked about this last time, I, I just love helping people. And so get good at life became that uh, book. And, and I wrote down a couple of things yesterday as I was reflecting on this. And I realized that what it was really was that I've just created a habit over the last 15 years or so as being a professional speaker of collecting information, stories, anecdotes, research. And I have not obsessively, but regularly kept hundreds and hundreds of notes. And so when I went down this road, you said, what about get good at life? And I think, oh, maybe that's a thing. And maybe it's a legacy piece for me. And, you know, at age, uh, age uh, 52, maybe, you know, this is a, a book I want to write and tell the world about. And then I suddenly realized that I had hundreds of things to say. And so I spent quite a few stressful few months going through those hundreds and hundreds of things that I'd recorded and, and put them into different segments and all that kind of stuff and realized that actually I got a bit stressed. Amish. You, you did cause me a little bit of stress because I, I dove into this kind of like, let's look at everything I've ever written down routine. And then I suddenly realized, why am I so stressed about this? Well, I'll tell you why, because there's two, if not three books in all of the research that I've done. So what I did is I narrowed it all down into four segments and then wrote what is now going to be called Get Good at Life, but maybe it's part one. I don't really know how that'll go. But um, but yeah, so I, uh, I've written about three books worth of stuff. <laughs> so yeah, it's been, a, I'm absolutely delighted that I was able to speak to you in 2022 about this stuff and that you helped me but at the same time realized that it caused me an enormous amount of work and but i'm so glad that i've been through the process and i think if anyone's written a book they'll know exactly what i'm talking about like you become a real expert by writing a book um and the re the real is because you have to do the research I can't stand books that aren't researched. I can't stand people making random claims in books. So I spend weeks and weeks following up things, um, you know, like goal setting, for instance. I've always had a bit of a problem with prescriptive goal setting, and I never know why. So I investigated it, and I found out why that is, and I found out, of course, a lot of the nonsense that's taught about goal setting. So that's in the book, um, you know. And so it's those little bits of research that I did uh, ikigai, you know the um, you know that well, don't you? The Japanese thing, of course. So I, I thought, well, I better research that. I'll just put it in. It's just in a little. It's just in a couple of pages in the book. Something useful to look at. Ikigai, which is you know often finding an easy way of finding your purpose. Although of course it's not designed for that. It's it's a whole way of life in Japan. Ikigai. So you look at that, and then you find out that the the diagram that everyone used was was produced by a uh, a life coach from Guernsey. And it's nothing to do with, with Japan at all. So, so uh, someone who's one of my reviewers who just read the book, I've just said it was wonderful to hear someone who actually did the research and said, yeah, you know that Japanese thing we keep talking about? Well, it was written in Guernsey. Uh, so it's in the Channel Islands. So I love that kind of stuff. And you don't get that unless you really go for it and write a book. So, yeah, it's been part of my life for the last, um, well, yeah, maybe the last nine months particularly. Uh, with a few little pauses here and there. But, uh, yeah, so thank you for sending me on that journey. I think maybe in September I wouldn't have thanked you, Amy, but I'm thanking you now. I think that's what I'm saying. And it's really interesting because in the conversation that we had last time in episode 252, you spoke about this knowledge being everywhere and that people don't necessarily value wisdom. And yep. wisdom being a really important value for you. And it's really clear from what you've just shared there that not only is, is wisdom and knowledge important, but it's, it's about how that then gets distilled and then how that gets disseminated across to the people who will value it. And that's about being really clear. Yeah, you're right. Because uh, knowledge is easy, isn't it? You know, it's just easy to, you know, uh, I mean, if people listen to, you know, the 300 odd episodes that you have on your podcast, you know, that I mean, the amount of information that they would have to take in is just colossal. 
And then there's every, every one of your excellent guests will have further reading and not just their own books, but they'll say, read this and all of that kind of stuff, you know. And it, it's, it's a fascinating thing, really, that we can um, gather knowledge so easily now, you know. But the problem is, is we don't filter, like you said. And so we need to understand of where's the wisdom in that. And and I I joke uh, I joke I joke sort of te temporarily um, or very quickly in the book I joke about um, I think in the introduction I write something like this will be very down to earth this is about what works for me and it's about what works for you and it's the research so I won't be asking you I think I put something like I won't be asking you to do a headstand uh, on top of a frozen lake uh, while holding a satsuma you know it's not that kind of book. And there's so many uh, myths and uh, legends and and uh, things that are just wrong about the personal development and self help type industry. That, that but these things get propagated, and I'm always fascinated. And I think they get propagated because a people don't do their research, and b because people prefer knowledge over wisdom. Um, because knowledge is is indeed is is filtered through your experience and the people you surround you with and stuff like that. So, yeah, so knowledge is a is a rarer thing, I think. Um, I wasn't reflecting today on the phenomena which has become on social media, which you may have seen, but I just suddenly put it on Facebook this morning because I suddenly have started noticing, probably because of what I'm writing and stuff, that there is loads of random people now trying to diagnose their followers there's influencers trying to diagnose their followers' uh, mental health issues. You know, people read a blog about ADHD and then they say, well, if you could, if this happens to you, then you've obviously got ADHD or you're obviously, you've got this or, you, or you, you're doing this or you're depressed or something. And there's loads of people giving knowledge out about serious mental health issues, but they don't have the wisdom, the experience and the real study to back that up. And that, I think, so yeah, so... I guess I'm saying knowledge can be dangerous as well as good for us, I suppose. And it is that, that knowledge is of no use unless you apply it. I think it, you put it into practice and that's something that Chekhov said. It's very much a case of, yes, take it on board and, yeah. and use it, but use it for what? And that's what I want to ask you and use it for why, essentially. The, yeah. the piece behind the 50,000 words, why? So why did I write 50,000 words? Is that what you mean? Yeah, because I wanted to help people. And so I thought, what do I need to write about that? So I've probably got a life. I guess we've all got a bit of a life message, or maybe we have two or three life messages which stay with us. So the first chapter or the first section is called The Power of Connection. And it's about something. The first thing I ever wrote 20 years ago, uh, which was life is about the three R's, and that's relationships 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 and uh, that was not a guru that told me that it was my joiner that told me that and i stuck with that and i wrote it down and i've lived with that and so i so i reflected on that whole thing and called it the power of connection because for me the the big one of the big whys is we need to understand that life's about people and people will get on our nerves they'll annoy us they may hurt us but life's still about people. And so I say why that is. I show a lot of research. There was uh, some research done in the tsunami, for instance, in Japan, where they found when people were separated from their family, they found that the people who were separated uh, got much more poorly and ill than the people who were within families, for instance. So the connection is it's a practical thing. You know, connection works. And then the second section is called the pain of disconnection. And what happens when it all goes wrong, Amy? So it's 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 practical steps of people that have that I've struggled with, people that have maybe hurt me, people who've said stuff to me and done stuff to me, and how do I deal with that? And there's loads of top tips about repairing. Um, so I talk about three about about repairing a relationship, uh, retuning a relationship, so you know that that person's changed or you've changed or you've moved on that's a retuning and then finally the releasing of a relationship when you can't do anything about it sometimes we just have to release people back into the wild as it were and uh because a lot of people hang on to relationships that have failed and that's not good for us either so so yeah so the big core of the book really is that and so i decided to start with that 
my editor told me not to start with that. She said, start with motivation. And uh, I refused <laughs> to do that. And I said to her, no, because I need this. This is the fundamental thing for me, that we need to understand the power of connection. And if we do that, then we can build everything else on that. Um, so, yeah, so that was that section. And then uh, the third section is how to be motivated. Um, and the fourth section is how to keep on going. So that's the resilience piece. And that's the biggest chapter, actually, with hun well, hundreds, dozens of tips on resilience uh, from the stuff that works and as well as mentioning the stuff that maybe doesn't as well. So, so yeah, so I guess that's kind of, because I thought if I put them in that section, that's a nice way. That's, you know, I want people to understand relationships. I want them to be motivated. I want to help them to be, to keep on going. And if I write anything else after that, it'll be filling in some of those gaps or going a bit deeper with those subjects. So that's kind of me and the book in a nutshell. That's what I've been uh, researching for many years now, I suppose. Yeah. And I agree with you. It was something that Alfred Adler said, which is that all problems are interpersonal relationship problems. Okay. Yeah. Which is when you start to, to dissect that and you think, oh, no, there's that. And you go, okay, then that's because of that. It, it is true. And I do believe that at the core of, of your, your reasoning behind this and, and why you, you've put it first and why it's your main focus is because if you don't understand that piece, how can you do anything else? If you don't understand what people are about or yeah, what you're also, about. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I was just about. Yeah, I was just about to say that exactly that. We're going to, need to understand what other people are about, and sometimes I look at other people and I think I'm really confused by you, and and I don't understand everything. Uh, but actually, I think the second bit is understanding ourselves. And I was reading the other day um, uh, about sort of the deep work that we do as human beings, and I was thinking about the people who hate other people. I'm not a particularly hateful person. I think I try and love people. I try and understand. Sometimes I blow my cheeks and, and I shrug and I walk away because I don't understand something. But I don't really hate people, I don't think. I don't think that's in my nature, really. But I was thinking about people who do, people who hate you know, immigrants and refugees and uh, people of a different colour or a different race or a different religion to them. And I suddenly I started thinking, I was reading some stuff about Actually, the reason that often people hate is because they haven't done the deeper work on themselves, that they don't know themselves enough, and so therefore they project their stuff onto other people. Um, yeah, and what, one of the weird, weird little things that I noticed before is that often the most racist uh, areas of the UK are the whitest areas of the UK in lots of ways. It's not, uh, and, and, and you know, I've been in these areas, it's not, they don't tend to be multicultural areas. They tend to be people that are just mainly white and they're scared of the unknown person. That's often the thing, because I think it's because they haven't done that work. They don't understand that relationships are like uh, that are important. And um, therefore they, ref they see the world, I think maybe through a different lens, I suppose. Maybe that's my thought. We each have a different lens and, and, it's it's fascinating, you know, built on our values, our beliefs, and and then our experiences. And with that, as you say, a lot of the the unknown causes fear. And so a lot of what we experience is coming from two places, which is love or fear. Yeah, the, the unknown is a is a really powerful thing, isn't it? And of course, there's certain tabloid newspapers that just feed on the unknown, don't they? Um, yeah, but I won't, I won't keep going on about that, but uh, that's the reality. I think that's the reality. I think, um, that people are, yeah, they don't. And, and so, so therefore people don't understand people and the value. And so therefore they put their focus in something else. So when someone has road rage, you think what's go, what's going on there, you know, and obviously that's, you know, how dare you, you know, upset my world or I'm stressed or, I'm running at 100 miles an hour. I haven't got time to sort out a form to fill in for my car accident. So there's lots of stuff going on in road rage, isn't there, for instance? And you just wonder, there's a lot of a lot of angry people, a lot of hateful people out there, really. Well, emotions are there to, to for us to pay attention to. They are fantastic navigational signals of what's going on for you and to take notice of them and say, is this what I'm experiencing in the moment or is this something that's happened in the past? And 
look, we're not going to go down this line. This is a no, very no. different area, but <laughs> yeah. it, it is it is of huge value to to understand to get good at life that there are so many different layers and elements to what you're you're sharing here, and you've got your four different chapters, your four different segments of the book. The purpose piece, the why, where does that come in? Yeah, so the why I, I put into the motivation section. Uh, I mean, there's literally a whole thing about why. And obviously, you know, and because I, I always thought about that way before Simon Sinek made it popular again, you know, um, you know, and I'm glad that he did, you know, and it's a, it's, it's a useful thing and I find his talks useful. But yeah, we've all been talking about that for decades before that was even mentioned. It just became popular again, I guess. And um, yeah, so the why thing, I think if people... Calling myself a motivational speaker has its downsides um, that people expect me to be able to instantly motivate them. That's not me at all, because no one can motivate anyone else. It has to come from inside. And the biggest way you do that is by getting people to reflect on the why and just trying some of this stuff out. I was recently with a group of head teachers. There was uh, 90 head teachers uh, at a conference. They'd taken a couple of days out, and I, um, I thought they wanted to ask me to do an hour. I was going to do an hour's presentation and then sit down and have a nice meal. They wanted me for the whole day. So I had them for the whole day, did four sessions with them, and I pushed them really hard on the why. And these are highly intelligent. Uh, many of them have got MAs and a couple of them have got doctorates and highly academic, intelligent, good leaders in their field. And yet they just soaked it up. They just loved talking about the why. And they were all a bit stressed out. You know, there's just really poor... Schools are just coming out of the COVID thing and there's still a lot of cuts around and the finances are difficult. And they they literally sort of just wanted to talk about the why. And I, and I started going, take you back to the first day of teaching. You might be a head teacher now, but 27 years ago, what was that first day like? You know, who were the little kids that you met on that day that, that kept you going? And I just got them to reflect on some of that stuff. And I realized, and obviously you've done 300 and something episodes about this, but it's such an amazing subject and it goes so deep. And I literally unpacked that for a whole day um, with them. And they were just, they just couldn't get enough of it. They just loved every minute of it. And they love to talk it out as well. Because I think there's something, isn't there, Amy, about, I guess that's what a podcast is, right? That you need to talk this stuff out in, you need to put it out in the air. Sometimes our brain, uh, sometimes it's not good to, to internalize this stuff. You have to externalize it a bit extrovert speaking right but i understand that, that i think that's helpful and they were literally talking on tables and you know uh, reliving the why that they do what they do and they went back to their to their schools you know i think happier and more energized because they'd reconnected and the busyness um of being in a leadership role uh, had had stopped them doing that i think so yeah so it comes back to the connection piece the, the reconnection to understand what it is you're doing, why you're doing that, and yeah. the drivers that are giving you the the energy, the reason for being, the reason for getting up every day. Something you mentioned last time, and I want to pick up again, is the value of asking difficult questions. And yeah. essentially, you know, the why, what, the why question, it seems easy, but people don't actually really explore it yes i, th I think an, um an, 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 and hmm. it's e it's easy to live life uh, on the surface isn't it i think it's an unfulfilled life but it's it's quite easy to sort of bob along on the surface and i think you know and it's good to have an examined life where we actually look a little bit deeper and i, I think those things are those things are important and i think the value thing is is big as well um if we don't reflect on what our values are, why, I don't know how people can live their lives really. I don't know how they carry on <laughs> living their lives. And they kind of, but kind of, if we don't understand a bit about our values and a bit about the why, I think we're all kind of sort of fumbling in the dark a little bit, really. We're kind of walking blindfolded everywhere. Um, I, I, and this has helped me to reflect a lot while writing. What is it that I want to say to people? What is it that I really want to do? And, um, what is it that I want people to remember, I suppose, you know, if I was to drop dead tomorrow, you know, would this book book be helpful to people? And I think it really would be um, because it's asking to be a little bit deeper. And I think we'd never get there unless we permission other people 
to ask us difficult questions. And that is a scary prospect. So I think, you know, that idea of accountability is wonderful and supportive and cuddly on one level, but kind of really scary on, on the other level. Um, so yeah, there's, 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 I mentioned it a little bit in the book. I think I'll probably go into it deeper another time. It would be a whole book on its own, but yeah, there's, there's three or four guys in my life uh, that ask me difficult questions and their permission to do that. And I tell them if I'm having a good day and I tell them if I'm having a rough week and I know that, that they do the same. And at the time of recording, one of the guys that's in that group with me, his dad is, is, will die any day now. So his dad is literally on his deathbed. And so we're texting and, and phone calling, you know, do you want to, I don't push myself on him, but I said, do you want to talk? You know, I'll send him a funny text or something or just keep in touch with him. And he's rang me a couple of times and, you know, he's talking to me from, you know, from the house where his dad is about to die. You know, these are big personal things and no one should go through the death of a parent without having a friend to help you and support you and see you through. So, yeah, it's pretty serious stuff. The book's fairly lighthearted, by the way. This is all quite serious stuff. <laughs> but I do try and lighten it up with some interesting stories. But, uh, yeah, I think... We all need people in our lives that ask us questions. And I have that for both business and my personal life. And those are the things that have kept me going all this time, I think. And I'm, I don't want it to sound flippant, but getting good at life, you have to understand how to get good at death. Yeah. And understand what it means to actually live and what it means to prepare to die. Yes, I think, I think you're absolutely right. And in fact, I wrote a chapter on grief, um, but I chose not to put it in the book because I think it will go in the next book. Because we we lost, I lost my my grandchild uh, in August, and uh, it was a stillborn girl called Miriam who was lovely, and we met her uh, briefly, but we met we met her, uh, but she didn't breathe while she was on the earth, as it were. So one of the reasons my book took so long is because. But, you know, I had to take a month off dealing with family stuff and everything. So in the middle of the book, we had a big bereavement and a big trauma, really. And so, yeah, we do travel. But but I, I've got a faith. I'm, um, I'm a Christian. I had a faith most of my life. And when I say that, it, it conjures up all sorts of weird stuff. But I would call myself a non-religious Christian. So I'm a pretty relaxed kind of uh, person. I'm not... Um, uh, weird and religious, I think is probably the best way to describe that. If in the, so my faith means a big thing too. So yeah, I do believe there's more than just what we see on the earth, but everyone believes different things or they believe nothing. And I'm fine with that. And that doesn't really affect me. You know, I worked with anybody, I work with anybody. That's what I'm saying. But, but certainly I asked big questions, you know, when you, when you see your daughter, you know, um, losing her child, her first child, you know, that's a pretty traumatic thing. And it does get you to think about some some big things. So, yeah, I wrote a chapter called Get Good at Grief, uh, like an ironic title chapter. Uh, but, yes, I decided not to put that in because I didn't think it fitted. It was a bit of a jolt to the book. It was a bit of like, oh, t- suddenly talking about that. So I think that will come in the in something else, a separate book or in the next volume of that book, I think, really. I'm talking myself into another volume here, aren't I? But I'm not going to write anything yet. I'm going to have a rest, Amy. I'm going to have a rest. (laughs) There's a theme here where we have these conversations and then the next book arises. So, Amy, when I listened to our last podcast, our last podcast together, there is something I need to ask you. So I'm going to make you a little bit accountable because I said to you, oh, you've written a book about the why stuff, haven't you, Amy? And you said, oh, no, not yet. Now, that was over a year ago. So I'm asking you, Amy Rawlinson, have you written your book yet? I am in the process of, thank you for asking. And it's really exciting because it has been a long time coming. And I'm actually on a writer's retreat next week to get into it in more detail. It's a really exciting book. It's different. So yes, it is about purpose. It is about why. Uh, but it has a very different spin. It's a conversation with my deceased grandfather. And between the two of us, we're going to be talking about purpose, which is, it sounds weird, but I found last year and my grandfather, my grandfather's book that he'd kept 
I found it in my grandmother's possessions. He would kept a journal whilst being a prisoner of war. And so he went into the Second World War. He was held captive for the best part of four years. And his writings are incredible because he talks about purpose. He talks about a planned life. He talks about the why. He talks about all sorts of things that I talk about now. So I figured that I would have the conversation that I wish I'd had with him when he was alive, but use his writings and use this incredible piece of history and write it as essentially the podcast conversation that I would not be able to have because he's no longer here, but we have it in that way. So yeah, it's a very different type of a purpose book, but it's going to be, uh, it's a very exciting project. I was just looking at my phone to look at the notes because I've been writing some similar stuff around that. Yeah. So yeah, so that's like, the, is it Victor Frankl that wrote the big book? So yeah. What's really interesting is Victor Frankl was in a concentration camp at the same time, but he was 16, 17 years older than my grandfather. He had already had his profession as a psychotherapist. He had incredible knowledge of the importance of your freedom of choice, of understanding that your decisions are yours to choose no matter what the circumstances and what the suffering. Whereas my grandfather had a resource of literature. He went into that prisoner of war camp age 21. Very different time of life very different circumstances. And so he drew on his literary sources of, of characters that would help him. So he drew on the philosophy of Marcus Aurelius or Plato or Shakespeare even. And so that was how he dealt with being a prisoner of war, not knowing whether the next day was going to be his last day on the planet. Was he a, bit of a, was he a bit of a was he yeah, a bit of a Gnostic then in that way? That's was a some area of that. Yeah. Yeah, so he, he didn't have a faith, but he does he does talk about prayer and the importance of meditation and and just understanding more about himself. And he talks about the importance of a planned life. Now, it's really interesting because you if you look at the the Blue Zones work that Dan Butner has done, or if you look at the the happiness project that people have, have studied or, across the world. The I think it's the the Nicoyans of Costa Rica. They talk about the the planned life, a planned life, and how this is. And I talk about my podcast is have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Yeah. So so here I am looking, reading this book of being notes and reminiscences and and various written poems and plays and all sorts of things that he's put together whilst in captivity so that was all the censored element and then when he came back he literally just dumped everything that he could remember about everything as an uncensored piece that's in that book as well and so as a as a, a, well, story, a bit of stoicism maybe stoicism possibly uh, yeah absolutely there's 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 so many different different threads being weaved into this so when i when i was thinking about the book i was going to write and the how to live a life with purpose, essentially how to live, stop filling in the moments, but create fulfilling moments, you know, all of this. It was, it was just not resonating. It wasn't coming from the heart. It was just, oh, another personal development book or that well, people will put on the shelf and say, yes, I've got that book from Amy Rowlandson, focus on why. And, and I wanted more, it had to be more. And then when I had this personal connection with a very important moment from my grandfather that he experienced, had he not written that journal and kept his mind alive, he could have been swept up with digging a tunnel, climbing a fence, escaping. I would not be here today. So it was, it was his choices that he made that meant that I am now able to chronicle that journey as part of the purpose piece for and both of our legacies to leave as a, as a combined piece. So there we go. My gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, there, is, there is a World War II story in the book, actually, that I do, I do share. So there is some good stuff around that. But yeah, and I've just bought the Victor Frankl's, the second sort of second book, which was not a book. I think it's a series of talks, but I've just, I'm just reading. That's my next thing. Because the weird thing, I don't know if you've worked this, is, but when you're writing a book, you don't read other people's stuff. So when I was, uh, when I, uh, I used to be a, a DJ in a 
producer and a, it was in a hip hop band back in the days. And one of the key things was you don't listen to anyone else's music while you're making your own album because you end up just copying their album. And it's the same with the book. So actually, I haven't been reading very much uh, because I've just been doing research and stuff. So I'm looking for, I bought a couple of books and Victor Franco's second book is one for me to read because I just want to get back into reading a bit because <laughs> when you're in the book mentality, everything you read becomes then goes into your book and you end up, and so it's just, it's exhausting. So I'm <laughs> I'm uh, choosing to just read normally. In a couple of weeks time, I could just, read again and it'll be nice and listen to audio books and things uh, so yeah so i guess you you're in that phase now of planning i suppose and um working that out is, is your retreat to write or is it a planning retreat i've done the planning uh now it's a it's a case of of putting it all out and and formulating it i'm it's almost writing it as though it's a screenplay. I see this, I see it as a movie. I, I see it in my mind as a movie. It's very visual for me. And so I think that I can write it in that to fro piece of, of going from one story and then coming to another and almost as though it's the flash forward, a flashback. And then, and yeah, it's, it's exciting. I think that's what's so good about the writing process is that you can be so creative and you can piece it together later, and but just get it all out onto paper. So really exciting, yeah. really really oh, exciting. That's great. Well, I've I've done my, I've I've sort of written my books written. I chose to write it for people who don't write book that don't like books very much. So I've got it in. So within the four sections, there's what I call a deep dive, which is me going into some deeper stuff, and then there's quick wins, which are just a paragraph. Most of them are just a paragraph on each page. So you do the deep dive into, you know, the power of connection. And then there's like eight little quick wins that you can just, so people can lift the book up and fl flick through. And that's what I, I like about that. You can write yours, which is a, which is going to have a narrative all the way through it, like a screenplay. And, and, uh, but I'm aware that I just, because of the nature of personal development, I just want people to sort of grab this and, and, oh yeah, page 22, that's changed my life. And then they don't pick it up again for another three weeks. So so yeah, I love the way that we can write completely different books, um, but maybe you know tackling different subjects. So I'd love to, uh, I'd love to see that when it is out. It sounds exciting. Thank you. I, I don't know if you've ever read Edith Edith Eager's The Choice. Uh, she no, I haven't. Man. It's a fabulous book. So that's that's another one to put on your list, because again, it, it comes down to freedom, yeah. choice, purpose, and yeah. she tells her life story. But within that, you take you take away a lot of the messages that she's sharing through the power of the story. Um, and it, it, and that is very much a gift that people share in, in the writing sphere. And uh, there's a brilliant book by Stephen King called On Writing. And he talks about yes, the craft. About I've, never, I've never read it, but yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, he talks about the craft of writing whilst also then telling the stories as well of his own story so but coming back to you lee <laughs> I, I was going to ask you if you could reduce the concept of your fifty thousand words into a a soundbite into a, a moment if you if you were to sort of describe it as that that would be the key takeaway for the listener gosh i'll try um so yeah, Get Good at Life is about connecting with people, connecting with yourself to understand how you are motivated, and then learning how you can keep yourself going. So it's down to earth, it's practical, and it's research led. That's the book really, in a nutshell. Oh, it's funny occasionally as well. So I guess there's that as well. So yeah, it's understanding others and yourself and then uh, yeah, gosh. Well, I could read. I could read loads of. I've had some quotes come in and stuff like that, but I won't bore you with loads of things like that. But they're all saying a similar kind of thing. You know, it's a nice from everything from it's a pick me up till this will sort your life out. So I'm happy with either of those things, really. <laughs> and you mentioned earlier that at this stage of your life of turning fifty two, this being a legacy piece. And that, you know, should for any reason you get knocked over by a bus, you've got this piece done. This is a, a fabulous legacy. What do you want to see happen 
as a result of this book going out there? So I, I, I really love those moments where the light bulb goes on in someone's head. And as a professional speaker, I kind of live for those moments, really. Um, when I go in front of an audience, those are the bits that keep me going. When I see that light bulb go and people go, ah, right. So that, that is what I always aim for. Uh, those I call them ding moments, you know, when the when the bell goes off in your head, and I, I have a, I always have a very large bell, bell nearby, so it's those kind of like ding kind of moments, and I do a joke about about that. So it's those things that I really love, and I and I guess maybe I, maybe I'll be nice enough to hear from people who've read it, and it's helped them get over something, it's helped them to achieve something, um, and so the, yeah, those things are lovely. And I was. Um, talking to a speaker the other day and he was saying how someone stopped him. Uh, is that a good friend, David Heiner? Um, he was a great speaker. And, and so he was in the school recently speaking and one of the members of staff basically came up to him and said he changed her life like 12 years ago or something. She was a kid in the school and he'd said something and, and she went off and I think she got a degree or an MA or something and came back as a teacher went to Cambridge and did all the things that no one thought she could do. And that's because she heard his talk. And so it's those little moments. And I've had little moments like that, maybe not quite as dramatic as that, because uh, Dave does have a lot of dramatic <laughs> instances like that because he's wonderful like that. But yeah, those things are nice when people say you really helped me or you got me through something. And um, But that's not the reason I do it. I just do it because I think it's the right thing to do. And I think, yes, last time on, I just said fundamentally, I just like to help people. And I've managed to arrange a job that gets me to do that, um, which is always a privilege because I still have a lot of people, there's a lot of people in the world that have a job that they hate. So, you know. I always know if I've done my job well on, on a show, if I create a goosebumps moment for my guest where they get goosebumps in thinking about something that I've asked a question and you, you, you said earlier that I don't ask many questions, but it, sometimes it's in the articulation that you sh you're sharing and you're unraveling a moment that you then realize that's why I'm doing this. And it's because you are able, you've got the space to share that in this, in this conversation. Yeah. I, you said, you said that I'm up, I'm to blame for, to, for you spending all this time writing this book. You wouldn't spend this time if it wasn't important to you, Lee. No, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. And as a result of this book, the the wisdom, the the process that you've gone through, I asked the question earlier about it being a priority for you over other things. Hmm. This priority of of getting good at life, for me, it you know it, it really is the, the the priority in in understanding who you are, what you're doing, and why you're doing it. That's why I'm spending so much time on this show with people asking that question to be the catalyst for shifting the paradigms that people have, and and also for understanding what the potential could be. Now, you said you want to fundamentally help people. I want to just ask you, when someone comes to you having read this book and they say it's changed their life and you get that moment that you just described from David Heiner, yeah. is that mission accomplished or is there more? Um, so it's, it sounds as if that's a really egotistical thing that I want people to give me feedback. That's not really what I mean by that. It's just nice to, to hear that it helps people. And I think when you hear one person saying that it helped him, there's probably a hundred that you don't hear of. So it's a nice kind of way of doing that, isn't it? I suppose. So is it over? Well, I think it, what I, what I try and do is is in the book, what I try and do is set people off on a bit of a journey. And one of the people who read it has said that Lee's a Lee's a is a good companion to have on your journey or something. Um, so that's kind of what it is. I suppose I'm setting up a bit of a journey, really. And I did, yeah, and I can give you an idea. I, I did something that I've never done before, right? I woke up um, one morning and I wrote what was, 
I'm very, very careful what I say here, was the vaguest thing that I've never written a poem before in my life. And it doesn't rhyme, but I've written something that's at the end of the book. Uh, so I thought I might share that with you. And I'm literally putting my heart out here because I've never ever in my life done anything. I'm a northern bloke from Leeds and I'm sharing with you a poem. So um, this is quite a different thing, but I think this kind of sums it up. And it's very short, so don't panic. Uh, it's called Look, Look for the Light. Uh, look for the light. Don't deny the darkness, but look for the light. The small chinks of light, the glimmers of hope, the funny things we notice, the quirky people we meet, those times of real connection, the loved ones we see. It doesn't take a floodlight to extinguish the darkness. A small candle will do that. Look for the light. And I'm kind of going a bit red and I'm a bit embarrassed to share with you. Look, I've just read a poem with you and it could be the worst thing in the world. But that sums up, I think, for the, it's, it's a change in attitude that actually the world is quite dark and it's quite difficult. And I, and I wrote that. Um, and I wrote that just after we'd lost my grandchild, Miriam. And so I wrote that in the darkness. I wrote that because that's one of the things that got us through that. Um, because there is light everywhere and there's these chinks of light and yeah, if you watch the news all the time, you wouldn't think that, um, but th that's the reality. And so, yeah, if I get people to see a bit of light, become a bit lighthearted, maybe lighter hearted, I don't know whether that's a word, but, um, um, yeah, the final chapter actually is, um, the final section of the book, uh, just before that bit is called, don't take yourself too seriously. And it's a whole reflection on, you know, maybe we just need to lighten up with stuff anyway. And that's sort of the end of that reflection, really. And so that, again, is, is I think it's an attitude. I think it's a choice we make. Um, I take my work very seriously, but I don't take myself very seriously, I don't think. And I think that makes a difference. So there, there's another nugget, I suppose. Um, but anyway. Thank you for sharing that, Lee. It, honestly, it was beautiful. and. It will probably be the the title of the episode, Look for the Light, because it does sum up beautifully what you're trying to achieve here. And yes, Get Good at Life fits in with all of the other books that you've you've written. Get Good At has been the preceding element to the, the series of books you've written. But this is a different piece, this this book, to the other pieces that you've done before. And and it is about the light in the darkness and that juxtaposition that way that there is always the the yin to the yang there's always the opposites out there but it again comes down to the choice of what is it you're looking for and that does come down to you to you making that decision and, and seeing what you want to see and choosing what you want to choose mm. yes you're right thank you for drawing it out of me so there you go <clears throat> never read a poem out before in public <laughs> i love that well the start of many to come <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's And it's in your book. So why would you not yeah. read it out? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lee, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show again. Thank you so much for coming back and, and sharing why you do what you do, why you are who you are, why you're doing what you're doing and fundamentally what you're focusing on and why the focus on why for you is, is so key. And for me, there have been many moments in here where I've I felt something, a deep connection to the work you're doing, to the to the work that I'm doing, to understanding again why, you know, we're both on the paths that we've chosen. And that's the the key thing here. You you spoke about asking difficult questions, about the permissioning that you can allow others to to have with you and how important it is to have those close friends. That's that's a key thing to the, the connection. It comes back to that piece that you started with in your book and started with on the show. It, it really is a fascinating concept of, of why people wouldn't think that wasn't at the heart of everything that we do. So thank you again. What would you like to say to the listener? Um, yeah, you could, if you want to, find out about the book you can find out about it if you want to contact me if i can help you in any way then do that there's a pre-launch um 
page for the book, and that's leejackson.org forward slash book, leejackson.org forward slash book. And there'll be some quotes there. There'll be a little sample, some videos and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's stuff I've got to do in the next couple of weeks uh, for the pre-launch, which will be towards the end of April. So, yeah, they can have a look at that. And I just want to thank you for listening. If you got this far all the way through, thank you for listening. And uh, Amy really is uh, wonderful. And do subscribe and make sure that you listen to some of the other talks because there's some real gold dust in there. Uh, so thank you, Amy, for doing your job brilliantly. Thank you. So, Lee, do you have a final word for the listener, please? Yes, I'd just like to encourage you to don't give up on people. Don't give up on yourself. And don't give up learning. How has this conversation had an impact on you? What value have you received from tuning in? What are your reflections with actions? Please take a moment to leave me an Apple podcast or Spotify review sharing how Focus on Why has made a difference to you today. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, simply connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.